Hello, and welcome to School to Homeschool. My name is Janae Daniels. I'm a wife, a mother of six, and a former middle school teacher turned homeschool mom. I have kids in their 20s, all the way down to elementary age, and everything in between. Are you thinking about pulling your kids from the public school system like I did, but you are scared to death and don't know what to do next? My friends, I felt the exact same way, and you have come to the right place. I want to help your family leave the system so that you can take the hearts and minds of your children back. Hello, my friends, and welcome back. As of the recording today, I'm very excited um, because I hit more than 10,000 downloads today, which blows me away. So for all of y'all have, who have been listening and downloading this podcast, thank you. Um, when I started nine months ago, I thought that maybe a hundred people or like I'd get a hundred downloads, mostly from like my family trying to be kind to me. Um, and so to see today that, that it's over 10,000 downloads, I have been just flabbergasted and excited and want to thank you all for listening. Um, if you do know people who are leaving the school system or thinking about it, please share this podcast with them. My goal is to help as many people transition out of the system as seamlessly as possible and not have quite the traumatic experience that I had. I mean, granted, it's, it's going to be traumatic because that whole mindset shift that we have to make, that we aren't beholden to the system, that we so desperately believe that we are when we are in fact not beholden to it. And there is a better way for us and for our children. Although I do have to chuckle, uh, last night I was on Facebook and I didn't pay attention to which page I was reading these comments from. I'm trying to not get on social media as much. And, uh, anyway, and these comments were the, the, the lady, the post was, should I do testing with my kids? And I didn't pay attention to see that it wasn't a homeschooling Facebook page. And I was about to comment. I ended up commenting and say, you don't need to test your kids. Just it's a waste of time. Um, doing the state and national testing unless you're required with homeschooling. But, um, anyway, so all these people are like, the testing is so mandatory and important because they use that data to make decisions for the schools the next day. And, and there was several teachers who commented who were like, I actually opt my kids out of testing. And all these people are like, oh, you should know as a teacher how important that information is. And I thought, oh my gosh, we live in a nation of unthinking lemmings. We live in a nation of lemmings who are like, we should do this because we should, anyway, without actually doing any real research to find out, number one, it's not good for our kids. And number two, it doesn't do anything but damage, right? Anyway, that's for another day and another time. John Taylor Gatto talks about it in Weapons of Mass Instruction in great depth about the uh, national testing and state testing and how it's not effective at all. As a matter of fact, it's, it's damaging. Okay. Uh, let's jump into the topic today. Uh, share, share the podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, please rate it. Let me know what you think of it. Put it on, uh, app, rate it on Apple, rate it on Spotify. I love to hear your comments. I love to hear what you think. And if you have things that you want talked about, please let me know. And Kathy, you had requested something very specific, and I'm trying to find a good person to interview to talk about that. So I haven't, I haven't missed you, Kathy. Know that. Um, and that's Kathy with a K because there's a couple of Kathy's that have mes messaged me. So anyway, uh, but if you have something that you want me to discuss, I'd be happy to discuss it or find somebody who knows better than me about that thing. And I'd love to discuss it. So let me know. And I'd love to get your ratings and see what you think of the podcast. If you hate it, maybe don't rate it. I mean, you can, it's, you know, we're in a mostly free country. Um, definitely share your thoughts. If you, if you want to give me a five-star review, I'll take it, but you don't have to. So let's jump in for today. I want to discuss, uh, creativity versus consumption and how that affects us, um, and what that looks like and all of that good stuff for us and for our kids. 
So one of the conversations that my kids and I have on a regular basis is that they can't always be consuming and that ultimately I ask them how they feel after they've consumed too much screen time or too much, um, too much food, too much where, where they're taking and taking and taking. One of my biggest pet peeves is when children, and I'm speaking about my kids, watch somebody else playing video games on YouTube. It makes me bonk. I'm like, guys, is this like the, this is the highest form of laziness that there is. You're not even playing the video game. You're watching somebody else play the video game on YouTube. As some of you might know from listening to last week's podcast, my kids are on a video game fast for a month because it's become a little bit of a problem where they've been getting on before they're allowed to and doing a lot of consumption. So I've talked to the kids. I'm like, how do you feel when you consume a lot? Like, how does your brain feel? And Jacob just shared pretty bluntly with me. He's like, oh, I feel not great. Like, I don't feel very good about myself. I don't, I don't feel great. And I think that's, and I don't have the research behind it. Eventually I'll look it up and find some research, but I believe that consumption does that to us, right? It makes us feel useless. It, it, because we essentially become useless when we are perpetually entertained. That's a problem. The fascinating thing is the the switch from becoming like being creators in America in American history to consumers was roughly about the same time as the public school system was introduced as law in 1852. And and I don't think that caused the consumerism, but I do believe that I mean we we had the industrial revolution going on and you know, factories opening up and all of these things happening. And we be, uh, essentially became a, a nation of consumers. And I believe that's done us a great deal of damage that we've lost some amount of creativity. We've lost, um, we've, we've lost s- some amount of genius as we've become consumers. And I'm not just talking about material consumers. I'm talking about, you know, needlessly scrolling on social media and, um, watching Netflix or Amazon prime. Not that they're, it's bad to do those things, but I, I feel like it's kind of soul sucking. The other day I was pretty down and I was like, what is wrong with me? And, and this very distinct thought came into my head. Uh, you've spent too much time on a screen being a consumer. And I'm like, oh yes, I have. And I put my phone away and I went about, um, it was during the kids free time, but I felt that I felt that soul suckingness myself of having consumed too much. And, and I think, I think there's a balance between like educational and consumption. Like earlier today, most of my kids have today's Friday that I'm recording on a Friday. You're going to listen to it on Monday or, you know, another day, but it, it drops on Monday. And, um, on Fridays, all, but one of my children have an enrichment program they go to. And so the one that's home, his enrichment program is a different day. I tried getting them all on the same day, but it didn't work out. Um, His enrichment program is on a different day. So today he wanted to be a consumer, right? And I'm like, no, buddy, we're going to do productive things. And we, we got, you know, he got a haircut and some other things. And then he had to read his book and he had to do his narration of the book uh, in writing. And he did his math and and I said, we're going to watch a little bit of, of television right now. We're going to watch YouTube specifically. And, and so let's go ahead and sit down. And he said, well, what are we going to watch? Can we watch this thing? And I'm like, no, I have something very specific in mind that I want to watch. And so I, I was thinking about it because earlier today I got my hair cut. And um, she had mentioned, my hairdresser had said, hey, have you been to 
the the Denver History Museum. And I've never even, I had never heard of the Denver History Museum, which shocks me because I thought I knew all the museums in Colorado. This is one I had not heard of. And she said, you know, it's so immersive that that's actually where I learned about the Dust Bowl. And it was really cool. So we started talking about the Dust Bowl. And so that was fresh in my head when I got home. Um, and, and said, okay, Jacob, this is, I know what I want to, I want to watch with you. I want to talk about the dust bowl. And he's like, well, what's that? And I said, well, it's something that I was talking to, to, to my hairdresser about today. And I, I want to talk, I want to watch a couple of videos. So we did go on YouTube and we watched some videos on the Dust Bowl and the Children of the Dust Bowl, which then now we're going to get the book, The Children of the Dust Bowl, and read it together because he was really fascinated. He's like, so let me get this straight. He's watching this, right? And he's like, this happened in our country? And I'm like, yes. He was like, how long did it last? And we're watching the video and it was, we watched a very short video first, then we watched a longer video. Like a, we watched a one and a half minute video, then we watched a, like a 20 minute video. I said it lasted for 10 years. It went from 19, roughly 1930 to 1940. And these people had to move and it got so bad. They couldn't even breathe. They, they, and so we saw the pictures and he's like, oh my gosh. And he was really astounded and enriched. And though creation wasn't happening, it's inspired some things where we can create some things and we are going to go experience some things to learn more about the Dust Bowl because it became very, very real to him. I don't consider that being a consumer because that it was, he was filling his mind. He was, we both were learning something new, which is one of the things I love about homeschooling is that I learn along with my kids. I love that. I love that we get to learn together and I get to learn things that I never knew before that we never talked about when I was in public school. Um, and so, so there's times that we can use technology as a tool versus being a consumer. And in that case, we, we used it as a tool and, and now we're going to be able to create some cool things based on some of the things that we talked about. And we're going to go experience some things based on what we talked about rather than just having it be a means of consumption. But I feel like sometimes there's educational videos that are more entertainment than they are educational. And so something that's something I've been very aware of, but he and I had this discussion again about being a creator versus being a consumer and, and all that good stuff. So it's fascinating to me because one of the tenets of Charlotte Mason is handicrafts and the need to do, to, to create something that's of value. I go nuts. And I did even in public school when my kids would come home with the stuff that they would make, like with worksheets and they'd cut the paper out and they'd glue it on. And, and I, I, and you, you know, the kids want to keep everything. And, and it got to the point that I felt like a lot of what they made was junk, but I wanted tangible, touchable, like things that mattered. I loved when the kids made things like out of clay or when they worked really hard on a beautiful painting or a picture. And I still do. But now that we homeschool, I realized that I have to take that one step further with creation. Um, I came upon this really cool article and I, there's actually two articles. They're both from psychology today. Um, I'll put the links in the show notes so you can, can read it. But this one is by Dr. Oh, let me see you find her name here. It's Dr. Carrie Barron. And this is what she says. Um, it's the article is called creativity, happiness in your own two hands. And she says, purposeful hand use enhances well-being in a tech technologically saturated culture. Research has shown that creating or tending things by hand enhances mental health and makes us happy. Too much time on technological devices and the fact that we buy almost 
all of what we need rather than having to make it has deprived us of the process that provide pleasure, meaning, and pride. So we've been reading Little House on the Prairie, and we're actually on Little House on the Prairie right now. And in the book yesterday, as we were listening, they talk about in great extent, Laura Ingalls talks about her dad building their house, building the door and building these things. And my kids were totally fascinated by this. Now we're making a little wooden car, my daughter and I are, and I, I pulled out the scroll saw and I put it in our basement on the table in our basement, which is not meant for woodworking, let's be honest. But right now our garage is in the process of being decluttered and clean. So there's not a space there and our cars are in the other part of the garage. And so we started woodworking on a car and she was totally enthralled and mesmerized by this car. Um, last week, and, and she's, she's been sanding it and she's been, uh, getting ready to paint it and she designed it and it's a Pinewood Derby car. We're not in scouts, but it, we're doing, um, like a, a local race. That's not scouts involved necessarily. If you are in scout, that's, that's great. You'll do the Pinewood Derby and they get really intense and man, those dads get really intense with those races. But, but she got totally focused, you know, here she is eight and she was totally focused and has been very proud of her design and very proud of the work that she's been doing on the car. I did the cutting of, you know, on the scroll saw, but, but she's been really proud of her work, um, and proud of word working and wants to do more. And she brought up mom. I want, I want to sew more. Um, so last week, as I was about to say, I just had this, this need that I needed to, to do art. I needed to be creative. I needed to make something beautiful of substance. And, and so I, I made a background, a foreground and a middle ground of a scene from little red riding hood. I drew it. I love art. I've done art for many years in my life. I'm, I'm okay at it. I'm not like, I would not consider myself like an artist. I'm not a professional artist by any stretch, but I'm a decent artist. And, um, and so I made this and then I made copies. And then a friend of mine was like, can I get copies of that? Cause I want to color it and put, put it together. Cause when you put it together, it creates a three-dimensional scene from, from not little red riding. I'm sorry, from Goldilocks and the three bears. And the kids worked on their art project while I worked on this. And it was totally fulfilling to work and create with my hands. Then I, I made a copy of it. I made a PDF of it. I cut it out. Um, it turned out really cool. I should have brought it so you could see it on YouTube for those of you watching on YouTube. But anyway, it turned out really, really cool. I sent it to my friend. She's printing out multiple for her daughter and her to do together to color and cut out and make this three-dimensional scene from Goldilocks and Three Bears. And it was so fulfilling for me. And it was fulfilling for my kids as they worked on their own art projects that were beautiful and, and thoughtful and time, um, that, and took time. They weren't rushed. Uh, in the article, she goes on to say that creating something with your hands fosters pride and satisfaction, but also provides psychological benefits because it can uncover and channel inner stirrings, wound smart less and grow growth ensues. When you make something you feel productive, uh, sorry, when you make something you feel productive, but the engagement and exploration involved in the doing can move your mind and elevate your mood. As you sift, shape, move, and address your project, your inner being moves too. As one of my clients said, it isn't so much what you can do, but what you do do. The process itself provides value. If we can treasure doing as much as having done, we provide new avenues for success, self-esteem, and self-repair. So I think that's fascinating that it's the actual process of creation that builds self-esteem. It's interesting. There, there's been some research done on children and self-esteem and undue praise given to children when they haven't when they're not deserving of the praise and it actually does is counterintuitive does more damage than it does good. Right. And I think back to my early days as a young mom with my oldest son 
And I remember very distinctly, he was in, he was in baseball in, um, in T-ball. And I, I kept hearing moms talk about buying trophies. So I asked the coach, I'm like, are we going to get trophies for all of the boys? And the coach looked at me and he's like, I don't do that with these kids. They didn't earn it. And I don't give out things that they don't earn. It, we don't do participation. Yeah. So I was one of those moms at the beginning. I learned. And now with my rest of my kids, they earn stuff, but I don't just give them trophies just to get trophies. So this is the, the, fa the, the fascinating, the fascinating study that's done on praise. Um, this is from the smartest kids in the world and how they got that way by Amanda Ripley author. They're also author of the unthinkable. Uh, and again, all the, anything that I reference, I'm going to put in the show notes so that you have this, have this, the evidence suggested that many American parents treated their children as if they were delicate flowers in one Columbia university study, 85% of American parents surveyed said that they thought they needed to praise their children's intelligence in order, whoops, in order to assure them that they were smart. However, the actual research on praise suggested the opposite was true. Praise that was vague, insincere, or excessive tended to discourage kids from working hard and trying new things. It had a toxic effect, the opposite of what parents intended. To work, praise had to be specific, authentic, and rare. Um, anyway, and so here she's talking about, about praise, right? Then this good gentleman, also in psychology today, um, Dr. Richard Saitoic, I'm going to butcher his name, talks about um, the same, he, he reinforces the same study that being rewarded for praise or being rewarded by praise when praise is unearned creates entitlement, it lowers self-esteem, um, it does all sorts of crazy stuff. But he he finishes with this. Um, this is what he says. To get self-esteem, do estimatable things. He says, the solution to this muddle is actually simple. If you want self-esteem, then do estimate, estimable things. Accomplishments and know-how can't be handed out or downloaded into someone's brain like they are for the characters in the Matrix. They must be earned through individual effort. It is the endeavor that generates a self of pride and inward esteem. Imagine handing a fisherman a, ca a prize catch. You may think you're doing him a favor and saving him the trouble, but you are robbing him of the pleasure. Instead, a fisherman wants to catch his own fish, not be given one. Numerous psychological studies have confirmed that satisfaction is an inside game. While it feels nice to be rewarded, the glow of the dopamine rush is short-lived and doesn't produce long-lasting change in mood or behavior. After the thrill of winning, for example, lottery winners and Nobel laureates revert to their previous temperaments. A look at accomplished inv individuals who regularly win awards and medals shows that they are driven by the effort rather than the, the result. It is the striving rather than the reward that is long lived. Furthermore, the knowledge of one's capability is continually satisfying through one's life, throughout one's life. Okay. So how does this relate to handiwork? Because I, I believe it's all related, right? Um, when a child is able to create something wonderful with their hands, and they do really good work and they do really hard work. That's when we praise them for working hard. We don't praise them because they're smart, which I've been guilty of in the past. We praise them for the work that they put in, which is healthy. And that actually increases self-esteem, but they themselves, I, I love that, that doing the work themselves is what that internal reward that it's the process that creates esteem. It's the process that's the beautiful part. It's the creation with our hand. Like, and, and again, like I, I have a child who does, who does animation online and that's, that's powerful and it's beautiful and he does great work and he judges himself and then he gets better. 
But then I also want him to create with his hands, whether that's cooking or whittling or sewing or building something outside or, you know, putting together electronics or putting together a motor or like they've got to woodworking. They've got to work with their hands. Our spirits need it. They need it. You know, we need it as much as our kids need it. We need to be creating and doing beautiful work and enjoying the process. Okay. I know making dinner is not always enjoyable, but when we create, like, have you ever noticed that when kids, when kids make something themselves, like food wise, they'll try it, they'll eat it. Have you ever noticed that? They'll, they'll give it a shot. When I was a teenager, my mom taught cooking, summer cooking camps in Texas. We did it for years and I was always her assistant and I hated it. I hated it. Um, now I'm really grateful. She had me do that for all those years and help her every single day for the summer, um, work and and help these kids learn to cook because now I'm a, a decent cook. But I'll tell you when those kids finished making and she'd make, she'd make big stuff with them. She's like, she'd get Cornish game hens and then have them stuff it and teach them how to make like, she treated it like a turkey. And she's like, this is how you do a, a turkey, except for a turkey's bigger. And they would stuff the Cornish game hen and they each had their own individual one. They'd make their own pumpkin pie. They'd make their own mashed potatoes. They'd make their own, you know, whatever we're making, th- their own pizzas. They'd make their own bread. And those kids would come away with such a huge sense of accomplishment that they had done something, that they had created something. In the beginning, God created. If we are in, made in his image, we were also meant to be creators. And there's, as they pointed out in this article, like there is a great sense of accomplishment when we make and create with our hands. That was one thing that Ron Hardman back in the episode where I, I interview him from Kilroy's workshop, he, he had talked to me about separately about how how powerful it is getting metal into these kids' hands and having them put it in the fire and pull it out and forge it. And these kids are as young as nine and they are proud of the work that they do. And I think in in our country, we've lost that art of working with our hands. And there's so much satisfaction that comes from that. I was so satisfied after making that 3D little scene. I felt so much satisfaction. It felt so good to draw it and, and, and then cut it out and color it and make the, the, you know, put the three pieces together. I'm, I'm really fascinated by the way, by pop-up, you know, paper pop-ups and paper cool paper things. Like, I I don't know. I don't know what the fascination is, but I really am fascinated by it. Paper engineering, I think is what it's called. So my challenge to you is to start doing things with your children that involve their hands. And I'm not talking about little, like when they're little, sure, little paper products, projects are fine, but like helping our children create beautiful things. And let's say that you have something that you want to learn that you learn it with your children. I was given these skeins of yarn and lessons, as I mentioned, for Christmas from a good friend of mine. This one is called Raspberry Cordial. It's this deep, beautiful raspberry color. It's from the Anne of Green Gables and it's berry merino wool. And then this one is Marilla's brooch and it's their Anne of Green Gables line of of, uh, yarn. And I'm going to learn with my 16 year old daughter, how to knit. And let's be honest, I can buy a sweater for pretty cheap, but I'm learning to knit, to learn the process because there's so much satisfaction that comes with working on our, with our hands. You don't have to learn to knit. Maybe you want to learn to cook. Maybe you want to learn to make cheese. I also kind of secretly want to make beeswax candles, like not the rolled up ones, but like the dipped ones. Like I have this desire to make candles, which is so random. But anyway, now I know why, because there are psychological benefits as this good doctor, um, talks about there's psychological benefits 
and dopamine's released as we create with our hands. My challenge to you is to do it with your kids. Make beautiful things with your kids. Learn to sew, learn to do woodworking, learn to cook, shoot, learn to do sushi rolls. We just did that a couple of weeks ago and we tried it months ago. It was a disaster. Tried it again a couple of weeks ago. I actually got a good sushi rice recipe. Um, the New York Times one, I just Googled it. New York Times had one and it turned out fabulous and it was the rice that mattered. We got medium grain rice because our grocery store didn't sell short grain rice, but it worked. And there was so much satisfaction and the smile on my kid's face when they're like, I did this. I made this. We made vanilla uh, the other day. Thank you to Kathy for that idea. Uh, so I bought stuff to make vanilla and we made homemade vanilla and my kids are shaking those bottles every single day, even though you only have to do it once a week. And there's so much pride and satisfaction, not only from me, but from my kids. You can see the delight in their eyes. We are meant to be creators. We are. We are created in God's image. He created us. We in turn are meant to be creators. So this week, that's what I want you to do, parents. My dear friends, mamas and papas, I want you to find something that you've always wanted to learn to do and learn it with your kids. You take, take the bull by the horns. Choose something that you want to learn. It may not be knitting. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's taking a part of vacuum cleaner and putting it back. There. I don't know. Whatever it is, um, I challenge you to find something that you love that you desire, something that you want to learn or something that you want to do again that you maybe you haven't done for a while. And I challenge you to pick it up and create with your hands and bring your kids along with you as you create. You're doing better than you think you are. You're doing amazing things. My friends, I love you. I'm praying for you. You got this, mamas and papas. We'll talk next week. If you enjoyed this today, please like and subscribe. You could also join our private Facebook group at School to Homeschool or sign up for our newsletter at www.schooltohomeschool. Have a great day.